Hey, I'm so excited for this morning, you guys, because we have somebody that truly abounds. I went over to admissions office earlier in the semester. I said, hey, who do you, who do you know at, at, the, at the university, kind of in-house, that, that abounds in God's love and God's joy and God's faithfulness? And everybody kept saying, oh, Tiffany, 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 Tiffany Holland. You've got you've to get to know Tiffany. At, at, at first, I thought it was just because she has a really cool accent. You're going to see she's from Australia. She just kills it, Right. But no, no, she truly abounds in the Lord. Uh, She works here at Jessup in the ADC Grad Admissions Department, and you are going to be so blessed by hearing from Tiffany this morning. So help me welcome up our special guest, Tiffany Holland. Thanks, Thomas. Well, good morning, everyone. I am so honored to be up here talking to you. Um, But just as much as I am um, when you come by my desk in the admissions office, um, how many people tried Vegemite at my desk last week for Australia Day? Anybody try it? All right, the challenge goes out to all of you to try um, Vegemite. Uh, We celebrated Australia Day, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that um, in a minute. But before we do that, I want to introduce you. Um, Speakers always introduce their families when they get up on stage. And um, they always put really nice pictures um, of their family. And I'm going to do that as well. But I did threaten my kids because um, we look nice and normal, but my kids are crazy. They're very crazy. I have a 13-year-old girl um, and a 10-year-old boy. And you can go ahead and show kind of our family picture. We look normal, right? Yeah. Um, My husband, Nathan, and I have been married for 18 years. Um, Yes. Um, And uh, anyhow, I'm already grooming my daughter for Jessup. So she's going into high school next year. um, And she's going to be here. But actually... Um, my kids love theater a lot. Any Hamilton fans in the room today? My kids are obsessed with Hamilton. We hear parts of the musical on a daily basis. Um, they know every word. And um, we actually bless them amazingly with tickets for Christmas. So we're actually going this summer, which is awesome. But until that time, we are going to be hearing Hamilton songs every day of our life, I think. Um, But anyway, they're awesome. I love them. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about my story. But before we do, do you want to have a bit of Aussie trivia? Have a bit of fun this morning? Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of multiple choice questions. Um, If Dr. Timms is in the room, you are not allowed to cheat. No cheating. Any other Australians, keep your keep your answers to yourself. Um, but we can put up the first one, some colorful, colorful treats right here. Um, think about that. What is the common name for this? How many people think it's unicorn toast? Anybody? How about fairy bread? Sounds magical, right? Dotties and cobba. Well, the answer is fairy bread, everyone. <laughs> And if you went to a kid's birthday party, you would see this. It is bread with butter and sprinkles. How can you go wrong, right? Okay, the next one, you might know this from from some movies. Is it A, a didgeridoo, B, a boomerang, C, a yobbo, or D, a bull roarer? How many people think A? How many Bs, Cs, and Ds? And if you said D, you would be correct. You would be correct. That is called the bull roar. All right, how about this cute little guy? Aw. Aw, he's so cute. Okay, do you think this guy is A, a porcupine? How many people think porcupine? A few out there. B, an echidna? C, a hedgehog? Or D, a platypus? That would be B, echidna. Yes, you're learning something this morning. You're learning something. All right, last one. Last one. I bet you won't know this. All right. What kind of tree is this? Is it A, eucalyptus tree? B, an acacia tree? C, a banksia tree? Or D, a gum tree? How many A's? B's? C's? D's? All right. The answer is C. It's called a banksia tree. Yeah, and I'm actually going to lock this tree in your mind because there's some significant things about this tree I'm going to tell you about um, later in the message. But um, Banksia trees are everywhere in Australia. They have these sort of bottleneck, I don't know how you describe the the flowers on them. I'm going to actually show you a picture later. But there's some really cool, amazing things about Banksia trees. So put a little little pin in that. I'm going to come back to it. 
But um, I've actually already, always had a thing for trees. I know that sounds really bizarre, but I love huge trees. Like when I see a tree that's enormous, it just speaks to me the life and the history and all the things that that tree has gone, to, gone through. And if you've been to Santa Barbara, you might have visited this tree that I'm gonna put up here. This is the Morton Bay fig tree. This is actually the largest um, tree of its kind in the United States. It's actually an Australian tree as well. Woo woo, Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Um, but it was planted in 1877. Go to the next slide with the roots. Look at the roots on this tree. It's amazing. You can't see this tree and not be in awe of how much, um, how much life is behind each one of those roots. But this semester we're talking about what it means to abound. And I can't help but think about trees and how they flourish when I think about the word abound. And it's easy to distinguish between a tree that's languishing and suffering and one that's truly flourishing and alive. So let's look at that word flourish for a minute. It means to grow or develop in a healthy or vigorous way. Look at the synonyms, to grow, to thrive, to prosper, to develop increase, multiply, spring up, shoot up, bloom, blossom, bear fruit, burst forth. My, my personal favorite, boom. All right, we're gonna boom. Um, but flourish, when you hear that word, it, it paints a picture of so much life. And that's the way that we are intended to live. You see, you were created to flourish. And flourishing means becoming God's very best version of who you are. Because there's lots of versions of your life, and there's lots of chapters, and God sees the very best, and he wants you to be that flourishing version, and he won't quit until he helps establish you, and heal you, and strengthen you, and grow you into that best version of yourself. And as he does that, you'll change, but you'll always be you. He's put so much uniqueness in each one of us that he just wants us to be better, not different, you're not meant to be like anybody else. He's uniquely wired you and made you to be exactly who you are, but there are better and better versions. Amen? Amen. All right. There's a, a quote that I'd love to put up here by John Ortberg. I love it. He says, when you flourish, you become more you. You become more of that person God had in mind when he thought you up. You don't just become holier, you become you -ier. Love that. You become you -ier. God wants you to become more you -ier. There's more of you, not only to bless those around you, but to bless the world. And I'm going to get to that a little bit later as well. See, as young adults, we're in such a hurry to find our calling and our purpose. And you guys already have 20, 30, 40-year plans right now as you're in college, right? There's that anxiousness to discover it and to find out what you're supposed to be doing and what's my niche and what are my gifts and how am I gonna be used by God and where's my place in this world? But I wanna tell you that the most important task of your life is not what you do, but who you become. Amen. And that is a lifelong process. That is daily saying, God, what have you put on my plate today? What are you calling me to do today? And that's hard because we're impatient, right? We want to make it happen. We want to be that best version of ourselves today. But God has layers and process, and it's in the process that we actually get to know Jesus in the most intimate way. See, your life is not your project. Your life is God's project. And that's pretty humbling because we have some good plans for our life. You guys have made a really great decision um, coming to William Jessup. You're pouring into your future and you're making great decisions. But ultimately, your life is God's project. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. See, we're on this constant journey to become more like Christ and do what he set out for us to do. And the journey really, it starts with our spirit. Our spirit has to be the place where that comes alive with the power of the Holy Spirit. And out of that comes all the abundance of what we're talking about. Um, in Psalm 1, I've got the scripture up there. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers. But those who delight, those whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. How many people want to be like that? Amen. Right? 
We want to be like that. Our, our growth is really contingent upon, upon that connection with Jesus. You know, we, um, we think so much about trees that are flourishing, having everything they need. Um, how many environmental science majors do we have in here? Woo! It's like four of you, yeah! <laughs> Woo, you're gonna love this because I'm gonna pull in um, some of the things that you're studying. And what's amazing is we can learn so much about God through his creation, um, through nature. And we can learn about science and we can learn all the things that naturally help a tree to grow and to uh, flourish. But I want to tell you that God has, he works outside of that. Not only can we flourish in times when we have everything we need, but we can flourish in really hard times as well. And God uses every circumstance for our growth. James 1 says that, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. See, we're gonna have trials of many kinds, unfortunately. Dave Ramsey, you know, says, it's gonna rain. Has anyone heard him say that? See, people say, why are you being so negative? He said, well, I'm positive, it's gonna rain, right? And it is gonna rain. It's not that we have a uh, negative outlook on life, but while we're on this side of eternity, we're going to have trials and we're going to have hardship. The Bible tells us that. It doesn't promise us smooth sailing and everything to be rosy. It tells us that things are going to be challenging. So just like with trees, there are so many things that threaten our flourishing. And the first is disease. Um, have you ever come across a whole bunch of trees that are all tagged and they look fine on the outside? They look perfectly fine, but they're diseased on the inside. They're rotted and that rot is going to eat that tree from the inside out. And that's what sin is like in our lives. We can look good on the outside, but we're rotting on the inside. And no matter how strong we seem to be, that sin has a, has a grip on us. But it has, the same, um, it has the same effect on our lives, however, we, it doesn't have to disqualify us from living a flourishing life. And the reason for that is because Christ came to ransom us from our sin and death. He paid the price for our transgressions so that we could be forgiven. But forgiven isn't all. It could be all, and if that was it, we could worship Jesus for the rest of our lives, that we have an eternity that's been paid for by him. But it's not it. See, if my daughter got in a car accident and she was rescued and they saved her life, I'd be so happy that they saved her life but I wouldn't be satisfied until she was completely healed. I wouldn't be okay with her staying in that ICU for the rest of her life. I would do everything it took until she could be fully healed and whole again. And that's how it is with Jesus. He rescues us, he pays the price for our lives, which is awesome, but he doesn't stop there. He's desperate to see us get healthy and whole, and he'll do whatever it takes to help us get there. Another thing that threatens our flourishing is storms. I've got a picture of a storm coming in um, on a tree, and there's all kinds of storms in our life. Um, one of the greatest ways of thinking about this is our, our pain and suffering. Pain and suffering we can't escape, right? Everybody has their own pain. We've got our own stories. We have our own things that we bring to the table. And um, I have more than my fair share of pain and suffering in my life. Um, someday, um, I will tell you a little bit about my story, but um, God not only rescued me spiritually, but he saved my life on so many occasions through abuse and kidnapping and all kinds of astronomical things. Um, and the Lord took me from that situation and put my feet on a firm and solid rock. He planted me in a great church, Hillsong Church in Australia, which is my home church, and um, he put people around me that became my family and my support. Um, I was on my own at a very young age. When I was in college, I had three jobs going to college. It's hard, you guys, I know it's hard. For some of you, just being here today is hard because you've got so many things screaming for your attention. But I wanna tell you that um, the Lord is the parent that never lets you down. He is such a good father, and he will help you get through everything. But when I talk about storms, I get it. I've been through many storms, and I used to think when I was a young Christian that, well, I've done my part, now I can just move on to blessing, right? And the one thing that's hard for us to grasp is that 
Blessing and joy can coexist with pain, and usually they do. We live in this life where we're balancing both all the time, and you know what? God, uh, he gives us the strength to do that. Under normal circumstances in our own flesh, we, we can't do that. But with Christ, he enables us to actually have joy and blessing amidst the pain that we're carrying. So anyway, coming back to storms. These things make us question who God is in our life. It makes us ask the question, why? Why did this happen? Why didn't you intervene, God? Why is this happening right now in my life to me? Why didn't this happen to someone else? Right? These are all honest questions that we ask when we're in the midst of pain and suffering. But I want to tell you that you may never get answers to those questions to your satisfaction, nor may you even actually be able to fully understand it. But I want to tell you that understanding will never bring you peace. Um, anyone been through a breakup in here? Yeah, all right, some honest people, like most people have experienced some sort of a breakup. And if you're on the side of the fence where someone broke up with you, you're like, why? Why did they break up with me? And you want to know and you think, if I just knew, then I could move on and be healed. If I just understood. And we take that approach with so many things in our life, don't we? We're like, God, if you would just explain to us, then I would trust you and we could move on. But you know what? The Lord asks us to trust him without the answers. Because you know what? He's trustworthy no matter what our perspective of the situation is. Some things aren't meant to be understood. But beyond that, God doesn't actually ask us anywhere to understand. He just asks us to trust. See, God isn't fair, but he is good. You have to think about that for a minute. If you're in my SFG, this last um, semester, we actually explored that. Is God fair? And there really isn't anywhere in the scriptures where it says God's fair. He's just but he's not fair, life is not fair. But we seem to think that for everything to be in balance, that everything should be fair. But the bottom line is that God is good. He is always good, even when we're experiencing such deep-seated pain in our lives, God is still good. But let uh, let me talk about another one real quick before we move on to the Banksia tree is um, barrenness, and that really shows itself to us in the form of disappointment. And disappointment can sometimes be more harmful in our lives than pain and suffering, because it's like a death. It's a loss of something that we thought would come to be. Disappointment makes us feel like a fruitless tree. It robs us of the way we think things could be, the things that should have happened, the way we should have things in our life, But disappointment isn't proof that God is withholding from us. Sometimes it's his way of leading us home. See, when you're studying money, and uh, anyone worked in a bank before? Uh, when, When you work in a bank and you work with money, they have you work with real money. Real money. They have you feel it, touch it, count it, play with it, move it all the time. Um stack it up, move it around, and the reason why they have you work with real money is because once you've seen the real thing, you can spot a counterfeit. And see, if we never experienced um, true love, we wouldn't be able to spot the counterfeits in our life. And God wants us to experience his love, and sometimes his vehicle is disappointment in love that lets us down. And that's hard, it hurts, but the Lord will always use it for our good. I want to put a scripture up here, or I'm sorry, not a scripture, but a quote from Lisa Turkhurst. It says, let's be honest. If we weren't ever disappointed, we'd settle for the shallow pleasures of this world rather than addressing the spiritual desperation of our souls. We don't think about fixing things until we realize they're broken. And even then, we don't call in the experts until we surrender to the realization that we cannot fix things on our own. If our souls never ached with disappointment or disillusionment, we'd never fully admit and submit to our need for God. If we weren't ever shattered, we'd never know the glorious touch of the potter making something glorious of dust out of us. Hmm. The next thing, I'm giving you a lot of good news this morning. The next thing is that our growth is dependent on death, on pruning. 
Sometimes we have to be reduced back to clay in order for God to make something new out of our lives. Jeremiah 18, six says, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of a potter, so you are in my hand, Israel. See, each of us has a version of me we think we should be, and it's, the, it's at odds with the version of me that God made us to be. And sometimes when you let go of that, it might be a relief. You're like, phew, I wanna get rid of that, dude. Not real happy with that version of myself, but sometimes it feels like death. And Jesus had a whole lot to say about dying to ourselves. John 12, 24 in the message says, listen carefully, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. Wow. I want to come back to that Banksia tree I was talking about. And um, you'll see here what it looks like when it's in f full bloom. It looks wonderful. But then I want to show you what it looks like in the midst of wildfire. And um, just like in California, we're pretty used to fires. Um, and in Australia, that's, it's a way of life in the summertime. We prepare for them. They're coming. Wildfires are coming. But something that's amazing about these fires um, is that many of the trees in Australia, including eucalyptus trees, are actually highly combustible. They're made to attract fire. And you think, God, uh, did you make a mistake? Because it's one of the hottest places on the planet. Why does it attract fire? And the reason is because many of these trees need fire in order to reproduce. They cannot reproduce without it, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of these little seedlings. They're kind of weird. Um, and, and actually, I've got a picture of, of creepy Banksia, if you want to put that up, a cartoon character. Um, we have a really famous book in Australia. This is the evil Banksia man um, stealing the gumnut babies. Yes, it's horrifying, isn't it? Yeah, but anyway, moving on, moving on, coming back. Uh, let's talk about these seeds. Um, these seeds of these trees are stored in these, these woody follicles and they're sealed with a resin tightly shut. I mean, when I was a kid, we tried breaking them open. We'd try and um, do anything we could to break into these, where these seedlings were, and you just can't. And the reason why you can't is the only way that that resin releases to open up that pod is with a temperature of 932 degrees Fahrenheit. The tree requires fire to release its seed. It can't do it any other way. And it makes me think about our lives, that there's certain things in our lives, there's certain seeds that the Lord wants our life to bless others with that cannot be released without fire, without death of the tree. You see, um, after the fire, it takes about 90 days, anywhere between you know, one and 90 days for these seed to be released. And they're actually released, and I'm gonna close with this, they're actually released as soon as they sense that rain is coming. The seeds are released into the ash, the rain waters the ash, and out of the ashes comes new trees, new life. Not only that, but these trees are built, I'm gonna show you another picture right here, yeah, there you go. These trees are built to renew themselves from the inside out. They're not dead from the wildfire, they regrow, they re-sprout from the inside out. And see, we might go through incredible death, incredible fire in our life, but that doesn't mean God's finished with us. It means that there's new life on the other side. And I want you guys to grab hold of that today and maybe see what is it, God, that I need to surrender, that I need to lay down and let you make a better version out of in my life. And that could be different for everyone. So let's read this scripture before we pray. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 8 says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. 
For in our light and momentary troubles, we are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is unseen is temporary, but what is seen, unseen is eternal. So Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this message today, Lord Jesus, reminding us that Lord, you will use everything in our lives for our good. You're not satisfied until we become the best version of us that you intended for us to be. And so, Lord Jesus, right now I pray that throughout the day and throughout the week, God, we would submit to you any area of our life that we're holding on to control of, Lord Jesus, that we need to lay down and let you make a better version. I just pray for everyone who's hurting in here, Lord, that you would um, not only help them wrestle that out with you, Lord Jesus, but help them meet you in that intimate space and feel your comforting arms around them. We thank you so much for your love and for your uh, love that doesn't give up on us until we're in eternity with you. We thank you for you and all that you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a good day.